Hi everyone, thank you again for coming to the ABD to PhD dissertation writing workshop for our spring 22, 2022 series. Our first session is Literature Review 2.0, Synthesizing Information. And I'm really happy to have uh, Nick Synergy, who is the director of the Writing Center for the University of Arizona's Think Tank. Uh, with us, as well as Dr. Leslie DuPont, who is the College of Nursing's writing coach. Both are longtime partners of this program. Uh, we've also worked with the Writing Skills Improvement Program in the past, um, Dr. Andrea Hernandez Home uh, in particular. And uh, our supporters are the Graduate Center, of which I am the Assistant Director, uh, the Think Tank Writing Center, the College of Nursing and um, the Graduate Professional Student Council. And so with that, I know there's a lot on the agenda today and I'm going to pass the baton over to Dr. DuPont. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Nick, for being here as well. Thanks so much, David. Hi, everyone. And I see some familiar names, which is great, and new names, which is also great. You are welcome to leave your cameras off as long as you want. We, we completely understand the notion of Zoom fatigue. Nick and I will have our cameras on, of course. Um, but when if, if we are in conversation and you'd like to turn your camera on, um, do feel free to do that. Also, as David said, um, you can either unmute yourself to contribute, ask a question, or raise your hand using the um, that little raised hand signal in your Zoom commands, um, or post a pop a question into chat. David, you'll be monitoring chat, right? Okay, great, great. Okay, so some of you were possibly here for the um, first dissertation, the dissertation or lit review 1.0 workshop in the fall. And that was more focused on gathering, you know, kind of deciding how you want to um, focus your search for literature, uh, talking about, you know, things like aims and research questions and how to really start gathering and organizing and um, kind of annotating the literature that you find. There's another process involved, however, and this is one that can get a lot of us to kind of feel derailed a little bit, and that is synthesis. It comes across as being really complicated, but it, as you learn, really get comfortable with understanding what synthesis really is, you'll find that you do it every day as a normal course of events and that you um, have tools that will help you do it with the literature documents that you gather. And so before we go any further, would somebody care to unmute and read the land, the U Arizona land acknowledgement? Could we have a volunteer? This Robin? is Robin. Yep, I'll volunteer. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the uh, U of Arizona land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the, oh, my little, it went away. Maybe somebody else needs to do this because I'm not getting it together here. Oh, here it is. <laughs> it's on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Great, thanks so much. Robin, it's great to see you here. Nice to see you. So, yeah, so here's a skeletal agenda. We will all um, massage it as we need to. We're going to talk first about how to think about a literature review and kind of um, recap some of the overall structure and ideas of a lit review, the purpose of it. 
Then we'll go into a more focused discussion of synthesis and critique. And I do want to make a point, too, that it's okay if you are not presently either working on a dissertation or DNP project or in a doctoral program. It's perfectly fine if you're in a master's program or at the beginning of any graduate program. At some point, you will be writing literature review and you'll be using synthesis and critique. So these are things that you'll find useful um, earlier in your programs as well as later. We'll then move on to the idea of starting with themes or organizational categories, do a few activities, and then just review some resources and make sure nobody has any final questions or that we've asked um, or answered final questions. So Nick, with that being said, I will turn it over to you. Cool. Just a quick little note about kind of uh, Leslie and my kind of perspective or the parts that we share in terms of our perspective. So um, I, run, I run the Writing Center. We, uh, we also have this graduate writing lab, which is a partnership with the Grad College and the Grad Center and Think Tank, where we, we do consultations with graduate students all the time. One thing that Leslie and I both share is this uh, kind of a history of working across a lot of disciplines. Uh, and the things that we're saying here are not going to be specific to any one discipline that you can map directly on necessarily, although we do have some examples that come from, you know, one or more of these specific disciplines. But I think the thing that, that uh, Les pointed out really nicely is that, you know, this is a kind of mode of conversation or analysis that happens when you do graduate level work. Basically, the idea here is that you know, our human bodies, our human brains, we're like, we are the, the conduit for all of these, these different scholarly conversations to be synthesized into a conversation that actually has a kind of direction. If you've ever dug deep into any particular scholar's, you know, perspective or work, you understand that it's easy to just start to see it their way. You see somebody making a concerted argument and you're like, yeah, of course, of course, that's the way it is. This is the way it has to be. This is the way the world looks. But what we do as scholars is actually break their ideas apart into these constituent pieces. And then we take the, the work of somebody else, or maybe we take the work of several people around one particular facet that we're interested in. And we try to put those things in conversation. And really, to this point in history, we're kind of one of the only beings that can really do that. <laughs> so maybe that'll change. Maybe AI will take over next year. I don't know. Uh, just depends on on what Tesla's trying to do next or whatever. But like the idea is right now, we're the ones who are able and, and in a good position to be able to take these various conversations or these aspects of these various conversations and try to make sense of those things and organize them into a story. Uh, something that actually has a direction that says, well, first scholars were exploring this thing and then they figured this other thing out. That was a new thing. So they had to deal with that. And now they have this conversation. So it's a, a way of sort of working through this analytically and also synthetically. And of course, when we're talking about synthesis, we're talking about joining things together. So there are a lot of ways of thinking about this. We can actually use several different um, heuristics. So like models uh, or metaphors even for thinking about this. Um, two of the ones that, that really have resonated with me over the years, having again, sort of this cross-disciplinary viewpoint, which is a kind of fun viewpoint to have, um, I heard it described once that when you're building your literature review, and a lot of times we're building this on the front end of something else. This is the front end of the paper, and what is to follow is your research, your actual clinical intervention, your experiment, some other kind of component that you're adding. You're setting up your, your own work, right? Uh, but what I've heard this described well, that I like a lot is almost as a genealogy, as you're basically picking or describing your predecessors, those people that you are citing as your, your scholarly grandmother and your scholarly great-grandmother and your scholarly grandfather. And what we're trying to do is ultimately have a way of being able to, uh, to say, these are the people and the conversations that I'm interested in talking about and of which my, my particular research is an outgrowth. So this is a way of being able to basically organize and synthesize some of this stuff that's actually already out there 
about a particular topic or set of topics. And of course, there are different ways of organizing and we're going to talk a little bit about some of that, but um, as a lot of us know, sometimes there are multiple conversations that are happening. One conversation is about what people are finding in their research. And sometimes the conversation is actually about how they're finding it, the methods. And both of those can sometimes uh, have their own ways of you know, organizing these kinds of uh, stories about literature. You can methodologically be associated with this group of people, but your findings are different. You find these other different, or these are uh, part of a kind of another conversation. So just to keep it kind of simple, what we're talking about is not a meta literature review, which is to say a survey of every single piece that's ever been written about uh, about a particular topic. We're generally more interested here in talking about the kind of front end section that we would often work on in preparation for writing, you know, again, like dissertation. So it'd be one of the chapters in a lot of different disciplines. They, they'll do like a full chapter that's a literature review, and then they'll proceed to talk about their experimental findings or something like that. What did I miss? Are there other things, Leslie, that you want to add? No, I think that was great. I thought this slide had the genealogy note, but it's a little further on. So, um, yeah, no, I think you made a great point. And and just to reiterate that, you know, we're saying whatever you focus on when you are looking at a specific body of evidence of literature in a lit review is um, guided by the research question that you are starting with. So, you know, and, and we'll look at some examples of um, sections um, and show you where you can find examples in your own discipline. Um, and you can get a, a better idea of what that means. But yeah, I think I think that that covered it nicely, Nick. Thanks. I'd like to add one, one thing too, and that is all of this material is only as relevant as it is interpretable to you in your field. So a lot of times when we're at various stages in our graduate career, we're sort of bombarded with a lot of this information that we don't quite, that hasn't quite synced up yet and mapped onto the actual thing we're supposed to be producing. We hear a lot of things that we shouldn't do, things a lot of things we should do in writing, but we don't yet know what that's really gonna look like when we go to write it. So this is a really good opportunity for you to, to bring up those questions that you might've encountered in your discipline. And we're not from your discipline, but we do have this kind of cross-disciplinary approach that might be able to kind of illuminate what might be, what they might be asking for. So if you've got questions, if you're like, I don't understand, this doesn't jive with the way that my discipline talks about literature review, this is a great time to bring that up. So definitely drop them in the chat or, or say it out loud. Oh yeah, and that reminded me too, before you uh, start with uh, how much content, um, some of you will be writing dissertations that have art they're sort of like the three manuscript version of a dissertation and so instead of having a, a more traditional five paragraph dissertation or piece um, you might have a section in the introduction of each of three different manuscripts that that are, you're sub going to submit as articles. So um, often embedded in those introductions will be shorter literature reviews where you know some of the main research going on in the profession, you, you pull it together and talk about it as it relates to your topic. Okay, so Nick, do you wanna, before I go in, take them into the campus repository, did, was there anything else you wanted to say about, you know, that whole idea of how much content should be in a lit review? Absolutely. So there are lots of ways of thinking about this. And, and to my mind, this is actually one of the questions that I think we see most often. The question is, basically, how, how deep do I rabbit hole? down a particular subject or a particular kind of question or a particular aspect of this literature. And that I think is the question and it's hard. There is no way of just being say, oh, well, you know, clearly you only need three paragraphs about each source or whatever. Because the ultimate arbiters of course of this and whether or not you've demonstrated that you have a, a, a good understanding of this particular aspect or subject um, are going to be your committee members and then the other readers. Uh, of the documents here. So it, this is the sort of challenge that we have as writers when we're going to approach uh, building out a literature review. But I like to think 
Um, I'm sorry, let's go ahead. And no, actually, uh, go ahead and finish your thought. Yeah. yeah, I like to think about this as, uh, as being able to provide enough context around your subject. Uh, so that way, by the time your reader has moved their way through, you know, your literature review, they're able to actually start to visualize what your vision of the field looks like. And we'll talk about this in just a little bit more detail coming up. But the idea is not only do they have a sense of who, uh, who you're sort of tapping into, your genealogy to use that, that heuristic, but they also understand that there are different sort of places in the field where there's a lot of conversation happening and where you align in that. So the kind of ideal situation is that you are be, you're able to kind of show your reader through your words, a kind of image of what the field looks like while you're also saying, and this is how I'm kind of carving out my little part of the field. So we're gonna have a, another example of that coming up really yeah. soon. But yeah. I said, the one last thing I said is, yeah. a, uh, having an example of this is probably your best bet. And I think that's what, what you were gonna say about. Yes, this. yeah, just a perfect segue to we have a wonderful resource called the UA Campus, U Arizona Campus Repository. In this repository online, there are dissertations, DNP projects, other uh, theses, masters and honors theses that have been written and uh, you know by students who've graduated, and these are across disciplines. Um, so all of the programs on campus are represented. So I'm going to take you there in just a second. And um, I wanted to quickly pause to see, David, are there any questions in the chat? Or does anyone have a question that they care to ask before we continue on? I have not received any, but now is a great time for folks to use the raise hand feature, or if you're a quick typer, um, or just unmute. The chat. Or just unmute and uh, share it that way. Either one is fine. Okay, I think we're good. So if you think of something, just um, let us know. Um, do that little hand raise, and um, let me just double check. Sometimes it doesn't show at the top. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, so the U Arizona Campus Repository, and I do want to assure you that there will be um, a PDF version of this PowerPoint in a shared box folder that all of you can access. These links will be live. So all you have to do is what I just do did. Just click on the link and it will take you directly to the Campus Repository. So you'll notice here, there are actually quite a few things going on, including faculty publications, yearbooks, catalogs, and so forth. But here are master's theses and dissertations. These are the two areas that will be of uh, most importance to, to those of you attending today. So you can click, there's several ways to get into it, but um, if you click on UA dissertations, you can then see, oh, okay, is my field, is my discipline represented? Um, okay, let's look at uh, psychology. So I'll click on that and should still be in dissertations. Um, but the other thing I'll do once I've done this is I'll try maybe listing it in, let me see if issue date, it's either ascending or descending. It might be, it's descending. I always get that backwards. So starting at the most recent and then what you've got is dissertations, pub, you know, like here, these are published in 2021. And the, theoretically, they're all in the psychology discipline. They might have different um, sub focuses within psychology. There might be other disciplines that sneak in there. But what this does is it helps you look through. You can also see if maybe one, one or more of your committee members is on 
any of these dis these uh, dissertations. When you look at a dissertation from your program, especially one that has um, the same chair or at least a, one committee member um, who's also on your committee, it gives you an idea of what they're expecting. I'm not going to you know, take us through the whole thing, but I'm just downloading and just showing you how it might look. Just make that a little smaller. And um, you get through, you know, you can see the focus, you can see if you, you can see the committee members, you can look to see what's going on in the table of contents, that often these pages are live linked. So if you want to jump to conclusions, you can. That doesn't mean you can always get right back up to the table of contents, but I usually just kind of estimate. I guessed this one correctly. In some dissertations, you'll have those manuscript versions and you'll have appendices and each appendix will list a separate manuscript with its own introduction, through, you know, methods, results, et cetera, discussion, conclusion. Um, other times, appendices will be extra information that's relevant, but, you know, maybe a huge um, table or just an extra document that is relevant but doesn't need to be in the body. So that just gives you an idea. And that way, here, for instance, I would look in the introduction to see if there's a literature review. And right away, you can see points being made and several sources being, um, you know, being cited. This is an example of synthesis. When you make a point that you have noted in more than one of the sources you've read, and then you cite those sources, that's a way of doing synthesis. Can I add? So let one, me know. Yeah, yeah. Let me add one quick idea that, uh, again, this is something that I think Leslie and I would, do, would probably both be very familiar with because of the way that we, we consult on documents. But it's a little counterintuitive for, for us when we're in graduate school, when we're being trained to like read really deeply. When you come to a document like this, it's helpful to come to it with a slightly different kind of approach. To look at it as an example, it's helpful to first look in a kind of structural way. So not even to necessarily dive into the specific, what like of actually what's being said, but to really just kind of skim through like the introduction, for instance, and say, how is this broken up? Are there subheadings? Um, that's another question that comes up a lot in graduate work. I don't know if I'm supposed to have subheadings in my field or whatever. And again, the ultimate arbiter is your committee, your, your chair, but you can actually get a kind of sense by looking at some of these other documents that have been approved and made it through the process, especially if it's your committee that's done or some part of your committee that's approved them, but reading it in a holistic way and saying, how are they breaking up these subsections? Are they breaking it up, for instance, by methodological approach? Do they, are they breaking it up by subject, by topic? Uh, are they just mashing all that together and in and, and one set of paragraphs they're looking at methodology and another one they're looking at, you know, some kind of findings or, or content or something. Um, the presence here of hypotheses is interesting as well. In other words, using this as a, as a holistic guide is actually sometimes pretty helpful too. It kind of, kind of allays some of these um, concerns like, oh, I'm, I'm making a big blunder, a big misstep uh, because I'm not organizing it in a particular way. Um, but yeah, and I think oh, just, just quickly, because this is just called an introduction overall, it's it is it's blending in the hypotheses um, and you won't necessarily create hypotheses. They may be objectives or aims, but it's blending those in along with a research question and the literature review all together. I just wanted to to uh, make that point. Absolutely. Go for it. If, what Nick, was there anything else that you wanted to say about this? Otherwise, I'll minimize it. Yeah, I think the only thing, the last thing I'd say is uh, if you are going to read intensively, you're going to actually try to understand what's being said in the dissertation and whether or not they're citing the right people and stuff like that, which is pretty, I mean, it's that's got to be pretty close to your work if you found an example that's citing stuff that you would be really engaged with at that level. Um, the one thing I would do is I would try to understand 
what each paragraph is actually doing, not just what it's saying, not just what kind of content is being discussed or synthesized in there. But a lot of times there's a, a paragraph makes it into a document like this and, and maintains in the document there because it has a purpose. The purpose is it needs to connect two fields of study or two subfields of study. Um, we know, for example, that our committee is going to say, wait, 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 but you didn't consider this, you know, this, this big seminal piece that came out in 1973 or whatever, and you know you need to put those things into conversation and have them. So trying to be attendant to the decisions about why to include that. I think is another helpful way to read in preparation for your own work. Absolutely. And um, I'm glad you said that, Nick, because we will be looking, I think, right after this slide at, nope, not quite. It'll be right after we come back, probably from a, oh, there we go. Um, we'll be taking a quick look at, um, right after this slide, at an example passage or paragraph. I just wanted to make a couple points about that. This is kind of a basic literature review structure. It's not, we're not presenting it as a dissertation structure. This is within a literature review. In one way or another, you're going to introduce the overall focus or topic and why it's important. Um, you're going to talk about the aspects of that topic that your particular review focus on. Notice this note, you don't have to cover everything, and that's really important. What you want to always be doing is looking for literature that helps you answer your research question and your objectives, aims, or hypotheses, or helps you think about how you want to, you know, frame your methods to, to collect data to help answer those questions. Um, you will also uh, sometimes find in some literature reviews a passage or two that talk about how you searched, what you searched for, how you selected the um, the usually published articles, but there might be some other pieces of research in there too. How you made your selections, what the date range was, keywords and search terms and phrases you used, study designs you looked at. Maybe you focused on um, certain, you know, randomized controlled trials or systematic reviews and meta analyses, you know, that kind of thing. If it could be too that your particular discipline doesn't have you write all of that information. And the way to answer that question, if you're sitting there scratching your head going, well, how do I know that? Go back to the campus repository and look at the most recent dissertations or master's theses, depending on your program, that have been published in your program. And of course, talk to your committee members and maybe um, some of your peers who might be a little further along in the program than you are. You're also generally going to talk a little bit about how you've organized the review. What is coming up? What are some of the big themes or organizational categories? In the body, this is where you'll be uh, Nick, you were talking about using subheadings, and I think this, they're so important to help you and your readers kind of move through a literature review. And these categories or themes can be sort of jumping off points. You know, we're going to talk about this finding from the research now, and then we'll talk about this finding or this methodological approach or whatever. And there are many different ways to organize the way you want to discuss the literature you focused on. And this is where most of the synthesis that you do will happen. The categories that you use, the themes or patterns you've noticed, that's where you're starting to synthesize already, those big ideas. And then within those big ideas, you'll find ways to show um, different maybe 
separations into smaller ideas that several researchers share or have discovered or um, are or want to look at more closely. Often at the end of a literature review, again, we're not saying always, but often there will be somewhere in there a discussion of gaps for what what isn't being looked at that you want to address or that you could see there being a need for. Um, often you will be trying to address a gap, some you know research that hasn't really, it's been done with multiple populations, but maybe not yours and so forth. Implications for future research might be at the end of a literature review, might also be in your conclusion. Often it depends on which implications you're talking about. If it's talking about your own studies implications, that would often come at the end of your own dissertation or article. You might give an overview of some of the major areas where researchers seem to agree and also disagree. What are the outliers? And finally, your general perspective on the research, and that's where you're kind of doing a quick overview of strengths, weaknesses, and limitations in the designs of the studies you've looked at, in the data collection that was conducted, um, and and the findings that were shared, um, and, and that sort of thing. So any questions before we zip on over to Nick? Okay, and again, as you think of them, please jump in. So that was the kind of written outline understanding of the, the work that kind of that starts to happen in the literature review, which is great, um, because a lot of times that is the way that we're approaching. You know, we need to like work our way through you know, these various steps, these various aspects. But I, I do want to call your attention to that word theme and theme is not a, a word that's, that feels native to all disciplines. Theme has this kind of like feeling that sort of, you know, humanities-ish and all that kind of stuff. Because, I mean, in my work as, as somebody who's, you know, uh, working on liter literature PhD, I mean, theme is, a, is part and parcel to what we do. We look for things that are like patterns where there's this sort of coalescing of something, something of interest, some kind of meaning, some kind of tool, some kind of mechanism or something like that. Um, so that word theme is interesting, but I find pretty useful. Uh, the reason why I really wanna dwell on theme is because I feel like when I've worked with graduate students on this aspect of their work, one thing I've noticed is the inclination to want to say, all right, I've got four scholars, Green, Smith, Bojangles and whatever, you know, here are my scholars. My first paragraph is going to be about green, 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 the whole way through. My next one is going to be about Smith. And then my next one is going to be about Bojangles. The idea is, which is the most interesting one always. Um, but the, the main thing is, it's like blocks of stuff. All of everything I know about this and then everything I know about this. And what feels weird about that is when you go to read it, you're missing one of the major um, mechanisms that makes this such a powerful thing. That major mechanism is that synthesis mechanism. So using themes instead is a way of getting those folks in the same paragraph talking to each other. And again, as scholars, that's really kind of the thing we bring to the table. We bring the knowledge, we understand what Green's saying, we understand what Bojangles is saying, and even though they didn't, they missed each other by two decades uh, in, in, chrono in chronology, we're still able to put them in conversation with each other because they might have, that might be a productive conversation. We can, you know, they might be in two uh, geographical locations, two chronological locations, lots of different things, but we can actually put them in conversation with each other around a particular topic. Uh, we can sit them at the kitchen table together and say, now what do we get if we smash you two together? What, what's the deal here, you know? So I like to think about this in terms of, again, these heuristics, which again are, are like these metaphors or larger kind of abstract ways of being able to think about this stuff. And one that I found pretty powerful in my own work is thinking about landscape. 
So hang with me here for just a second. This is abstract and I understand that and we're going to get into some specifics in a minute. And I think once we get into specifics, some of these abstract things might make might crystallize a little bit more. Let's hang with me for the abstraction for a second. If we look at the left hand picture of, mount, of a mountain range, what we see are these various peaks. If you were to think of those peaks as a collection of, of work, the aggregate of work around a particular topic or theme. So let's say one of those peaks is all of the scientific inquiry around the harmful aspects of smoking cigarettes. There's a lot, there's a ton. We've been aggregating this stuff for, for decades, right? Generally, one of the highest peaks, the tallest points would be the collected understanding that smoking is not good for your health. Okay, fine, we've been establishing that for a very long time. But there might be an adjacent peak, something nearby, the next, the next lowest one or the next highest one, I should say. Um, that's about the comorbidities of smoking. You smoke, you're also more inclined to get these other you know, diseases or other health, have other health problems or something. In other words, it's adjacent, it's related to that field. That's why it's sort of approximately, uh, approximately connected. They're close to each other. Uh, but maybe there hasn't been quite as much work in that field, in that specific subfield, as there has been in just generalized understanding about smoking, you know. And then if we were to look at the next, another peak that was sort of, you know, the next in line, maybe this is some, again, another adjacent field. Um, maybe it has to do with, um, I don't know, um, I'm just making it up, M mental health and smoking and whatever that, whatever that particular conversation has revealed about those two, those two things. So by establishing that there are uh, clusters of scholarship, a stack, if you will, a big stack of papers is the way I like to think about it, this mountain tall stack of papers that have been written and thrown out into the ether uh, about these particular topics, what we're able to do is we're able to say things in writing like, and there has been extensive research on the negative effects of smoking. Uh, within that research or, or, or along with that research, one point of particular interest in the last two decades has been the comorbidities associated with smoking and these other things. Uh, one less dis oh, uh, explored aspect of, of the detriment of smoking is smoking's effect on mental health, which is what I'm gonna talk about. You know, so you're sort of like, you're helping to populate a landscape for your reader of these like stacks of, of, uh, of research that have been done on these particular themes or topics. And then you're tracking where your kind of route, your route is, where your road is going and how it's passing by reference to these other, these other existing points of scholarship. So just to say that one more time, you're verbally doing this by being able to say in your citations, uh, there has been a long established understanding that smoking has negative effects on health. And then maybe you would cite five people that were these really big studies that long ago established this or over a bunch of years or something. In other words, your reader would be saying, okay, I know that there's a bunch of stuff here. So in my mind, I'm populating that. And then as you're kind of working your way through, you're able to kind of focus your specific, you know, trail, path, whatever metaphor you want to use there, um, to show that by reference to these other existing points of scholarship, um, that you're kind of plotting your own course here that's going to be through a gap, hopefully. We've all talked about gaps so far here. But the last thing I'll say about this particular heuristic, when a reader who is from your discipline reads this, hopefully this mountain range, this landscape is familiar to them. When your committee member reads this, they should say, oh yeah, yeah, duh. Like I know, I know these mountains. I've been, I've been here a lot, <laughs> a whole lot. <laughs> Every dissertation, I'm seeing these same mountains or whatever, but uh, but there's also a way of arguing that this landscape has been um, misdescribed. It has not been described accurately. And sometimes that's the argument we're making in a literature review, that while there's a lot of work on this and this, we've completely neglected to see that there's another peak over here that's also relevant. So there are kinds of fun things that we can do with thinking about this in a kind of abstract space um, that, again, we'll look at in a specific way coming up. I wanna just briefly mention this other mechanism because I think this will be a lot more familiar to you as a kind of heuristic or a device for being able to organize your thoughts. Um, it's all about puppies, which is true of life um, and love, puppies being love and being lovely and uh, 
the idea here is we take a whole a whole field and we're able to start categorizing and grouping the field using this kind of network heuristic and what this helps us to do in a similar way to the landscape is identify the major nodes of conversation the major aspects the major things or topics that are or, or even methodologies that have been uh, discussed a lot if you find yourself having difficulty organizing a literature review trying to figure out which things you want to talk about this is one of the most powerful tools i think you have at your disposal get a whiteboard big piece of paper for whatever reason drawing it out in a big way makes all of that works really well i don't know why you just have lots of room i guess um, but being, being able to basically categorize some of the major voices or major conversations in your field. And instead of putting, um, you know, under cute and fun, everyone loves them, or I should say, in addition to saying everyone loves them and referring to puppies here under the cute and fun subcategory, you could actually put green, Bojangles, Smith in that same bubble because those are the, the sources of that information. So you can literally group people this way too citations, as well as the sort of themes that you're grouping. Um, so I've used this a number of times, and then it's easier then when you go to start writing your, your piece, the first thing you do is establish, well, this broader field of puppyology is broken into uh, four main conversations or five, whatever, that they, you know, A, B, C, D, they grow into dogs, they, they're very loving, et cetera, et cetera. So it kind of helps you kind of get organized as far as the major themes go. I'll stop there. Okay, so um, that was a beautiful segue into here's an example of everything we've just been talking about the mountain range with the peaks, the, um, the puppy wonderful cluster diagram, and the sort of linear, more linear outline -y kind of diagram before that. What we're looking at is one passage from a literature review. In that passage, um, you're going to see several things going on. The first point here is the overall focus of that passage. I would say, I don't know, Nick, I would think, you know, a theme maybe or a point that they want to make. So here over the past decades, Voluntary environmental programs, or VEPs, have become important policy instruments for environmental governance. Now, I'm not claiming to know what I'm reading, but what we're focusing on is the structure. So this sets up the overall topic or one theme that the writer wants to talk about. It may also be a um, one offshoot of a larger theme. And, you know, there might be several passages that have different, different aspects of that theme. And voluntary envir environmental programs is one aspect of that larger theme, which could be environmental programs and their effectiveness. We then move on to this stated rationale for general program approaches. Now, that being said, it's not the authors, the writer of the dissertation, their rationale, although they may share that, but you know, that particular rationale or agree with it. What the writer is doing, what you would be doing is saying, here's what some scholars have proposed as an underlying rationale for these kinds of voluntary programs. And the synthesis happens because more than one scholar has, made, has proposed this rationale. And so you see two um, sources cited here, both of whom have proposed this rationale. Note too that you would be, as the author, putting this, you're, it's paraphrased, it's put in your own words, but it's carrying the main idea of both of these sources. Let me know too if any of that isn't clear. They then break it down a little further into discussion of successful and unsuccessful programs. And so here we've got, while well, some voluntary programs are demonstrated to have taken progressive steps 
to produce a high level of environmental outcomes. Others are reported as failing to show any achievement of environmental goals. And here we have the same two authors, but two different articles or studies that they've done. Now, however, we're going to break it down further into successful examples of successful. So here they say, take the case of. So that tells you, ah, we're going to go, we're going to go specific now. We're going to look at one or two specific cases and maybe one or two specific pieces of research, but we're not, that we're not focusing the whole paragraph on one or the other. We're not saying Darnall and Carmen 2005 stated that blah, 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 blah. In other words, it's not just a kind of a listing, like Nick was saying, of one person at a time in store one. Sorry about that. How long have I been muted? Like just five seconds. Oh, phew. Okay, so we're not focusing on one source at a time. We're interweaving a number of sources that have had that have had similar shared perspectives. And so it gets increasingly what we call granular or specific as we go into specific examples. We then um, make some more references down here. Most of the ISO 14001 studies found that program participation is associated with improvement in environmental practices. Then you've got about seven or eight different sources listed here, plus a footnote. So there's going to be, um, this is a huge sort of synthesis of one finding. If you see found that, it's saying, okay, this is a shared finding by quite a few studies and they sort of range and they're fairly recent, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is what we mean by one way of, of synthesizing or of pulling together commonalities and also showing differences. What are the outliers? Nick, did you want to add anything to that before we take a quick bio break? Yeah, I think I'm just going to close the loop here on our those heuristics. So I think when I read when I read this, I don't see that landscape as much as I see the cluster chart. And I think that's potentially useful when we're talking about different disciplines or different uh, different genres. So like if you're writing in preparation for delivering or presenting an experimental study, maybe that landscape idea is not the is not the fitting idea. Maybe the cluster idea is a better idea. When I read this actually, and the way that our notes at the top there go, it's actually a hierarchy chart. You could do it as like one of those, you know, uh, Microsoft hierarchy charts like you would do if, if you were looking at an org chart, because this very much has a uh, an overall focus statement that says these are the things we're talking about and these are the things that we're not talking about. Remember, every time you're saying I'm going to talk about VEPs within that discipline, that means that you're not going to be talking about a dozen other things that you could be that, that the audience could be expecting that you're talking about. Uh, every time I'm talking about, you know, modern literature, it means I'm not talking about all the other literature that's out there. So you're actually helping your, your audience do some of that sorting. And then the rationale is a higher order kind of concern than some of these specific examples. In other words, this writer spends a lot of time working that hierarchy or to use yet another heuristic, a funnel and kind of funneling people down from this very broad concern within their discipline of the EPs funneling down into these very granular examples of um, specific programs or studies that have shown that specific programs are working or not working. So it's cool. It's a cool little, little heuristic to, to kind of keep in mind. Just the, the idea that you can move between those heuristics, I think is a powerful one to kind of let you know that visualizing this, in my view at least, is a pretty important part of being able to, to, to help your reader get to that kind of nugget that you're looking for at the end. Great. Yeah, it's taking you through a discovery process. And uh, you can come at that in several ways. David, was there a question in chat? 
I saw something come. Okay. So let's take a five minute bio break. Everyone kind of uh, get your coffee or whatever you need to do. And we'll meet back here in, oh, I'd say at about, um, in about five, four or five minutes. It'll be a real short one and take it away. Sure. Yeah. I'm always interested to know if, uh, you know, I know that each of the disciplines talks about this kind of stuff in their own way. I mean, that's as it should be, you know, when you're a sociologist, you're trying to write like a, a sociologist, you know? Um, so that's cool. Um, always very interested in, in hearing though, if there are some other insights out there or some advice that you've heard uh, about how to construct these things. Um, I love just shamelessly stealing that usually and using it in other <laughs> consulting kinds of ways, but um, are there insights or other things that you've heard? I see something from I, Sriracha, and I'm so, so sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, please, please let me know. Um, who says, yes, discussion is useful for our discipline, doctor of nursing practice. Absolutely. Awesome. Any other stuff that's resonating or not? Oh, cool. Yeah. So I, uh, Lynn, I see your comment here. So yeah, social yes. network analysis. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Those visualizing of networks. Absolutely. Cool. Well, and that idea of using the discussion to, there's several uses when the, the discussion within the lit review of what's going on, but also the discussion in your own piece later of what you've found. Absolutely. Here's another one. Um, oh, <laughs> Lynn just saying, I didn't think to use it for my literature review. Well, uh, you know, we, we get these insights at different times. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> it happens. Great. Well, keep, keep dropping them in. If you, if you think of any, if anything triggers like, oh yeah, I heard that, um, uh, you know, to do to think of it this way or whatever, that's definitely a, a helpful thing for us. And, and it usually is one of the most powerful components of, uh, of what, the participants here take away is to just to hear what other disciplines are, are talking about. It's usually a very, a very cool thing. Let's talk a little bit about the guts now. Um, some of these decisions, I mean, it's difficult, I think, sometimes it can be difficult to, uh, to look at a mass of literature, a mass of stuff, all those scholars talking about all that stuff. Uh, even if you're able to sort of identify some of those themes or use some of those clustering techniques, uh, to be able to then start making some decisions about how this should kind of play as a sequence. Uh, and I do like to think of it like that. You know, we're in a very postmodern world and that's all good. But like at the end of the day, somebody has to read your section, your introduction from like the first word until like the last word. And you're lucky if they actually read from the first word to the la <laughs> last word. But you generally can count on the fact that they're going to like kind of proceed through it, you know. In, in a direction, in a particular way. So I like to think about this in lots of ways as a series of little lily pads, you know, and we're saying, okay, dear reader, um, hold off on checking Facebook for a few minutes and come with me and I'm gonna take you on this journey and we're gonna go through this little thing, right? In, a, in at the sort of ideal circumstance. The guts though, are really all about making those synthetic relationships, highlighting how, when you put these scholars um, in a room or at the same table paragraph, uh, how, how, what you get out of that, out of that particular kind of work. Um, and again, I think that's very much the kind of academic or scholarly enterprise is putting these things together, even if they're separated by time, space, and all kinds of other things. Um, so here are some things that we can think about as we proceed. So again, maybe where we are here is maybe we're in the earlier stages. Of, of drafting this out. And maybe we're trying to figure some of this stuff out before we really are too far into the viscera of it, into the, the real guts of what's going on. Um, or maybe we've started and we need some direction. And maybe we start asking ourselves these questions. Uh, so yes, we can always ask ourselves about these overarching themes, but sometimes it's difficult to understand what the difference is between a topic and a theme. And is it the same thing? Do we have to talk about it because that's what these people are talking about it, or that's what work has already been done. So we can start to look at, well, what kinds of findings have they, you know, have they revealed in there, have they found in these various studies? Are there clusters of findings that we can start to group together? Um, are there, is there a way in which we can frame a sentence 
that can earn three or four different citations at the end because that sentence is true of three or four different studies or different people or different you know kind of iterations um, what theories have you identified we mentioned earlier this sort of idea of um, your uh, literature review having an almost genealogical quality i find that's particularly true in my field so like literature or other humanities fields where you are picking a kind of analytical heritage and you're saying i'm aligned with these people and not so much with those people the, those concerns aren't really the concerns i'm trying to look at these concerns are but it works for theory too theory you can say uh, i have a particular theory of communication that i'm trying to tap into in my discussion of social networking uh, or uh, you know vir virtually or otherwise uh, i have a particular sociological cluster of theories that I'm interested in talking about and looking at, you know, whatever I'm looking at. Um, same thing goes with historical cultural movements. Again, it's sort of like picking a genealogy in a lot of senses. What major figures? This one, I totally agree, because again, the figure can be synonymous with the theory or movement. Um, my approach is a Foucauldian move, is a Foucauldian approach or a the theoretical approach because I'm talking about genealogies. Okay, cool. Also, this is where I just caution, don't conflate needing to spend a whole, like a paragraph or five paragraphs talking about one person's work, unless it is so pivotal to what you're doing that it cannot be put into conversation with other people. Most times you can take that one person, outline what they're saying, and then immediately put it into conversation with somebody else within the same paragraph. And that's ultimately the kind of synth synthetic work that we need to be doing here. So when you've started to write yourself into a hole about one thinker, pop out of the hole for a second and say, all right, who else is around? Who else can I pull into this? Quick, grab a shovel, let's go. Come on, Derrida, let's do it. Um, same thing with discoveries and trends. What we wanna do is make sure that we're, when we're drawing that kind of cluster or set of clusters, that those are, you know, we have the ability when we've drawn out a cluster diagram of the various trends that we we'll want to talk about. We have this really powerful tool, which is to say, I'm not going to talk about those clusters. I'm going to say they exist and then I'm going to keep moving. And that's a powerful tool. So you can say, um, there are five other clusters of scholarship out there that talk about these five other things, site, 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 that are not in the scope of this project and you keep moving, right? Thank you very much, have a nice day. Um, the perspectives that, that we've identified, again, it depends on how we're, we're, we're presenting this. A lot of times that can be synonymous with themes. And then agreements and disagreements. This one is a powerful one. Maybe, maybe this one is woven through all of these. Agreement, disagreement is maybe a simple way of thinking about relationships and relationality. Here's what I like to do when I'm working on relationality. I like to ask myself, Okay, I've presented something. This is um, Bojangles' theory on social anxiety, which I deeply understand. Um, you know, here's, here's Bojangles' theory. Who objects to this? Can I identify that just verbally? Can I, if I were describing this to a 10 year old person, uh, my cousin uh, or my nephew, if I was trying to describe this, I would say, well, you know, there was a guy out there who thought this, but there were like five people who disagreed with that really, you know, vociferously. Um, so can you identify who disagrees with that person? Can you identify people who have extended the work, clarified the work? That's another interesting group. Can you identify people who have uh, appropriated the work and changed some part of it? And can you identify what thing they changed? Those are the questions that are ultimately the questions that are really useful in trying to figure out where to go next in your paragraph. You're sitting there writing your paragraph. You discuss Bojangles' theory of social anxiety. You're trying to figure out why this is significant to your project, whatever you're ultimately trying to talk about. Talk about. So you start asking yourself those questions. Who disagreed? How did they disagree? Uh, who extended this? Who took a part of this and then twisted it and made a new thing or a different thing? Um, start working your way through those relationship questions and all of those transitions between paragraphs, the movement between these paragraphs, start to feel really natural because you kind of have a, you kind of understand now why this is re uh, relevant to this next thing that you wanted to talk about.
Great. Thanks so much. Um, again, David, I saw several things coming up in chat. Any questions or comments? Um, there wasn't a, a question submitted, but one of the attendees shared a resource called the Zettelkasten method and um, some personal knowledge management software suggestions. And I Excellent. provided a, a link to the Wikipedia page, but there's a lot more out there. Great. Thanks so much, David. Yeah, those links are helpful. Um, so David, uh, Nick, David, Nick, whoever, um, kind of piggybacking now on what you've been talking about is you start kind of narrowing down. This is just another way kind of of saying what we just said on the previous slide yeah. is that um, you're making organizational decisions and using them to create categories of some sort that you can then um, expand on. You know, what is... What are the researchers saying about this category, this idea, this finding, whatever it is, whatever that theme is? What's being said? What's being understood? What has been found? As you move through that, you're also thinking about strengths, weaknesses, gaps, limitations. And this is uh, this statement right here is the clearest statement I've ever read on that kind of separates it out and helps us understand um, gaps, unexplored ideas. Sometimes I'll think of them as underexplored. There might be an area that's been explored a little bit, but very so, so minorly, one of those teeny tiny little mountain peaks that it's, it's really more of a gap than anything and more, much more research can be done. Flaws, those are the weaknesses. You'll usually see the term weakness or weaknesses um, often related to the way a study has been designed. Perhaps the methodology, perhaps um, the findings um, were taken from quantitative data and it would have been, it would have worked better or a more extensive a uh, body of findings would have come out of either a mixed methods approach or even qualitative approach. Was there uh, some kind of bias that the authors, the researchers didn't account for, um, you know, and so on and so forth. So was the study itself created and designed in a way that limited the population too much or that really, you know, perhaps it could have, if the study were designed with a different design, with a different setup, um, or a different population, or different methods of data, and, or even different focuses on the data, then that might have strengthened it more. So flaws or weaknesses and strengths have to do with study design. Limitations generally have to do with either, you know, how generalizable is the study? This does not mean that if you read, for instance, a good DNP, Doctor of Nursing Practice project or article, just because it might have been with a very small population, doesn't mean you don't want to explore the findings or try your out, out an intervention of some sort, some kind of study um, on your own. It just means that as that readers can't assume that they can apply the findings that were in that small study to uh, on a large scale to a larger population. But Limitations aren't necessarily bad. They're just often they're just unavoidable things. Sometimes it can be that um, too many people in the population uh, dropped out throughout the study for one reason or another. Sometimes it's like a pandemic comes along and disrupts everything, everyone's way of doing things and nothing gets done in person. And so there are all sorts of ways in which um, strengths, weaknesses, gaps, and limitations can occur. 
Um, this note here is important. Often most academic articles will divulge, will share these limitations when they discuss their own study design or results. So as you look at an abstract, as you then jump to um, say the introduction or the conclusion, you might find that in the conclusion or discussion that the authors talk about here are the limitations of our study. Um, you know, these findings are significant, but there are limitations in how they can be applied. I have a pro tip. So yes. a, a pro tip gleaned from looking at across, again, cross disciplinary work here. One thing that I, I've noticed at some point or I learned at some point is that in most cases, if you frame the gaps in terms of opportunity, you actually make it a lot easier on, on yourself mm. to, or I should say the weaknesses as a, or limitations as an opportunity. And I'm not talking I about look at all of them that way. Gaps exactly. too. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm not talk, necessarily talking about your own study In your own study, you of course identify and divulge the limitations to say, this is, these are the limitations, but in terms of your literature review, one right. thing that makes it easier to actually write forward is to, to try to frame even the limitations of previous study or weaknesses of, of uh, previous studies as like um, building upon the work of, you know, uh, Bojangles and all these other people, it opens up a whole new vista of work that we can do. And it's a, like mm -hmm. basically framing it in a way that it's like, this is a kind of perpetual um, ever expanding sort of purview for research actually is really kind of liberating when you're writing because it's a lot easier to be able to write it like that and say these guys had no idea what they were doing they were extremely biased with an n of one that's not going to work so like your your critique kind of stops there so what you do is you say um, building on this study by expanding it it's it's uh you know the, the sample size by uh checking for replicability like there are all these different ways of being able to sort of like in this nice scholarly tone say yeah, that study, that was a kind of small thing that is amazing. It actually got done. But what we're going to do here is like open up a whole new area for research by, by saying, here's how we're going to use that as a springboard to go forward. Does that make sense? Right. It's a great jumping off point. Exactly. So, and I think that's important. It's kind of like in any, you know, polite conversation, you're not shutting people down or condemning them. Instead, you're again saying these are the ways in which um, this research has contributed. Some of it may not have been as far reaching as we would have liked, but it offers us a jumping off point, a springboard into a deeper dive, a deeper look into this area. Exactly. So let's, so we're going to start with themes. And when we say themes, Think of that word uh, in, in a way that works for you. It doesn't have to be like a literary theme. It, I sometimes will break it down into a pattern. You know, what are some ideas that keep coming up or patterns or findings or types of scholarly research design that keep cropping up in, even if I'm Early in my master's degree, already the reading I'm doing has shown me, I keep seeing this idea come up again and again. That can be considered a theme. And so what we're going to, so what you can do is one approach is to, and we will provide a version of this, is to use something like this. I just called it a quick and simple synthesis table. This can be a way of when you identify what we're calling a theme, but any, any kind of organizational category, it will be in word format so you can change the wording too. Anytime you see it in a source, pop, pop that citation in, Bojangles 2017, Green 1992, you know, whatever, but throw those sources in whenever you see them, you know, mentioning something that relates to a theme. That's another way of setting up. It's a real quick and dirty um, kind of rough way of synthesizing. And it gives you a sense of some of the patterns, you know, so the way the research um, is 
relating to different patterns. And um, so that being said, what we'd like you to do is, and I'm going to see, let me, oopsie, let me go back here. We're going to go to this URL. I can just pop it into the chat too. Not waiting room. We're going to say everyone, and I'll pop it right into chat. But it's uh, pretty short. So tinyurl.com slash lit rev sin one. So what we're going to, let's, let me make sure I, okay. This is going to take us to um, our jam board. And on this, uh, this jam session, there are four or five different boards. We're looking at the first frame right now. So I will do it on the shared screen. You should also see it in the chat. You should be able to click on the link um, and let me know. What we're seeing is some important points that even if, for instance, this idea of no consensus on definition of terrorism, generally seen in terms of warlike behavior, if it has a communicative valence, it is viewed as purely political. Um, We've got pushing into the nonlinear regime is tricky, as many nonlinear effects have yet to be modeled. However, as one puts tighter and tighter constraints on the neutrino mass, these effects become important. And here's where the sticky note failed and, and models some kind of effect. And so this is excellent. Even these types of analysis bias, um, these deficit-based research, deficit-oriented characterizations of indigenous peoples in data, yes, without political historical contextualization, right? So looking at something in a deficit way, but not contextualizing why that population might have um, you know, had that particular challenge or struggle or whatever. Um, so these are these are exactly what we're talking about. It's not about right or wrong. It's about what's popping up into your consciousness as you start, as you're learning more, as you're taking in more information, regardless of what phase you're at. So if you can start making notes of patterns like this, ideas, you know, find, you know, find a way to do it that works for you, then you can go back to them and pull out the gold nuggets, the ones that really speak to you, or um, maybe even start developing a question, you know, I, I want to look at that a little deeper, you know, why, why do we leave out the political historical con context so often when speaking of characterizing Indigenous peoples? Um, how, how are we thinking about data and data analysis when we do this that, that decontextualizes it and kind of weakens the data so, and misrepresents it? So things like that, you can start building a whole body of questions. Excellent. And let me just make sure I saw something come up. Um, it yes. Was, it was just a bad joke. That's all. Bad joke. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's see, let's, we're going to go back quickly to, uh, I think this is mine, yeah, all right, here's another way of organizing the literature, this is, and you'll see it called a literature matrix, a, an article summary table, a literature review table, literature review summary table, whatever, Basically, though, and here's really hugely detailed one. Here's half of it, and here's the other half of it, the one with the blue. Um, basically, though, when you look at a table like this, the first column is always going to be the source if it's a literature review table. In other words, this is where I got any of this information coming up. Often the next column will be um, a description of the study design, the population, um, you know, methodology, something like that. 
there might then, you know, it could go into various uh, directions. After that, here we have the purpose of the study and the results that were reported. Uh, there might also be results versus findings. There might be a notes column, or you can create and add a notes column. But what you're doing is laying out the most, most relevant aspects for your particular purpose of each source. And if you have a table like this and pop things in as you go, um, it, it can be very helpful. One thing that's really important is as often as possible, paraphrase, put things in your own words rather than just quoting directly. However, if you are running short on time and need to just pop some information in, like there's this huge results passage and you don't have time right now to, to narrow it down to one or two quick, here are the main, here's the main point under all these numbers then temporarily drop it in as a quotation and say, if this was a quotation, I would also put quotation marks and in parentheses a page number so that you can go back to it knowing that, oh yeah, I have to put this in my own words. Or if I pull directly from this, I have to quote it and here's the page or pages that it's from. So you've got all that in your chart what this kind of a chart helps you do, and it doesn't matter whether it's this one or any, you know, you find one that works well for you, um, is that it helps you condense a huge, that huge mountain peak or several mountain peaks of information into one manageable chart. And you often don't have to go digging back through most of those articles. Again, you might want to double check something, but you don't have to dig around in them. And Nick, was there anything you wanted to add on this too? Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd add a little, yeah, a little not at all. additional pro tip. I, I really like the idea of paraphrasing. It sort of gets one of the, the sort of two aspects of like the work, the labor that actually has to happen to move this from the reading that you're doing into writing. It's like one of the big points of labor that has to happen is some of that paraphrasing. The other point of labor that has to happen um, might actually deserve its own column as well. So consider if you have the time to do this, it's great. And if not, well, I mean, we all, we all write under constraints, right? Um, but I think if you could add an additional column that says something like in conversation with or something like that, where you had a, a column where you're able to say, this pushes back against this other scholar or something or this adds on, or this confirms, or this is a replication of. In other words, if you have a column in there where you're already starting to do the work of um, putting this in conversation with some, with some other work that you have, so you have this kind of intertextuality happening, then you're actually really far ahead of the game because then when you go to start organizing it, you've already begun to sort of see those themes that could be emerging because you see where people are, the, are overlapping or where they're disagreeing. So as much of that labor as you can do, I think you'd kind of Absolutely. do yourself a service. Yeah, and um, you can also use that other, um, here, let me see if I can get back there, that other quick and simple synthesis table where you can start plugging in sources that are kind of in conversation with each other. Um, another column can be strengths and weaknesses or gaps and limitations. So you can adjust a chart in whatever way that's useful for you. Now, that being said, if you're asked to work with a specific table or chart in your program, that's fine. You can always um, add columns temporarily or create a second chart that is more personalized to you. And then if you have to, for instance, paste your own, your, the, a particular version of the chart into your document, your dissertation, or I see this in the DNP project, um, then you've got the original version that you can use too. So we're going to do the next two jams. And um, again, I'll pop that into chat. Looks like David got it for you in there. Oh, thank you, David. 
that helps a lot. So yeah, click on those. That should take you directly to the next frame, but it's still the same Jamboard. So um, you can always click over. I'm gonna close this. So you're now on two. There are actually eight different jams. I, I, I duplicated one particular um, frame um, several times. So here's something that will have you thinking in a way you may not have started to think yet. What gaps have you noticed in the literature? And again, the, what we're saying here is what non-researched or under unresearched or under research areas have you noticed or do you think you're seeing um, in the literature? And you may find that as you keep reading on a topic that, oh yeah, I guess there has been research and I just hadn't gotten to it yet. But at this point, are you seeing any places where more research, you'd like to see more research done? Example, for instance, that idea of data that decontextualized, is there, um, you know, maybe designing a study, the need to design a study that um, looks at data on Indigenous peoples in a much more contextualized way, and what are some choices, or whatever. And then if you click on this arrow here, the right-facing arrow, that'll take you to the third one. What categories do you think you'll need to include in your own literature review table? And we know that at least one of you has written your lit review already. If you're still with us, was that Lynn maybe or Mary or some, um, if you're with us, what, what kind of thematic or topical categories did you use to organize your literature review um, or if you used a, a table, a chart, um, you know what, I went in the wrong direction with that. Um, this is for the table. So kind of back to what Nick and I were talking about. What categories do you think would be helpful if you design a literature review table for yourself? Strengths, and weaknesses, et cetera, whatever you wanna say. So just play around with these two now and take a couple minutes and ask away. I see a couple of questions, I think, in chat. Okay, no worries. Um, okay, great. There we go. Anything else? What other potential gaps has anyone noticed? What about, has anyone been looking for, say, research on um, maybe on um, a sociological issue or a disease or a method of um, examining the environment that that takes into account a particular population or geographical area or whatever. And while you're seeing a lot of research out there, you're not seeing that particular population or that particular geographical area. Good. A lack of exploration of the colonial carceral criminal justice system in Hawaii, especially in a way that is useful for legal practitioners and advocates. Nice. So in a way that makes the connection with, you know, how could um, legal practitioners and advocates use this information? Excellent kind of look and it to me and I may be totally misreading that so jump in it's like understanding the historical context of the criminal justice system how did it how did it end up the way it is so that legal practitioners and advocates have to take into account certain issues or um, requirements or legislation how did that all start and I may be way off so it's okay to jump. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Come. Is it a uh, committee? I don't. I know we've talked with you before, but or Kamile? It's Kamile. 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 Great. Yes. Kamile. Yep. Beautiful. Such a beautiful name. Thank you. Even as I said Kamile, I thought, no, I know she did the I. Yeah. Kamile. Great. 
Okay, so let's see if there's anything on this next one, too. Okay, so categories, what categories do you think you'll need to include in your own lit review? Model and survey choices with constraints. Excellent. Um, data, another one might be um, data types, models, um, sample groups, um, analytical approaches. It could be um, design weak flaws or weaknesses and strengths. Um, always, I always like to tack on a notes column in this kind of a chart too. Okay, excellent. All right, so we're gonna pop back into, we're, we're gonna start very soon, start wrapping it up. So Nick, take it away. Just a quick review of some checklists if you know that might be out there sounds good so i do think that for different people for different writers there are going to be different i would just like kind of approaches or resources that are going to be um, kind of the the threshold concept if you will if you're interested in that kind of stuff that helps to kind of allow you to to get your own kind of internal con conception of how these things can be built in structure um, do you so want me so to far, click on one? Yeah, sure. Let's do the Walton one. So, so far, what we've done is we've talked about um, we've talked about a kind of linear uh, outline form. Um, we've also talked about actually just going to examples and finding those examples. And then we've talked about a couple of uh, abstract forms for thinking about this, the landscape part. And we've talked about the, the idea cluster um, clusters. Uh, Kamali had a couple of suggestions in there about other ways of organizing these like sort of personal knowledges, which is really fascinating. Um, so there are like a lot of ways of kind of getting in here and getting going. And I do think that that is a thing that is important is basically not the panic at the white page, but using all of these things in any of these things and sort of being promiscuous and using and trying all of them and trying to see what thing actually helps you to, to um, to build your own kind of organization around what this kind of document needs to do. So I know that for some of us, not me in this situation, but I know for a lot of people that I've worked with, a checklist is potentially a really powerful mechanism for doing that. Because for some of us, we just need that like list to be able to say, am I doing it in a way that I can feel confident about? Um, so here are a couple of uh, starting places for checklists. I've always found when talking with writers that building one's own checklist is usually the most powerful uh, checklist that you can find basically because it speaks to your specific idiosyncrasies. Um, but as a starting point, here are a couple of examples and notice that there are aspects of the checklist that span the logistics of actually building this. So have you looked at, you know, at these databases? Are you looking at the appropriate databases? Um, you know, because you can get, you can get kind of lost when you're rabbit holing down specific you know, in, in your kind of like research area, you know, pretty easily. Uh, and then also thinking about your citations, thinking about uh, any of the other mechanisms that are now kind of woven into some of these uh, platforms that can like alert you, for instance, when there's a new, a new study that's come out that's in your area, that's always interesting. Um, using the, the people who are also really excellent resources here is another thing to try to remind ourselves of. And I don't think that every literary literature review requires that you avail yourself of every single resource. But what I do think is that it's really nice to uh, not feel circumscribed by a really uh, narrowly defined set of things that you could be doing. Um, that you really use these things to your advantage, uh, especially when you feel like you've reached some kind of impasse, to be able to then pivot quickly. Could I jump in for a sec? I want to just kind of piggyback on that. Two things. One is... Uh, every college, every discipline on our campus has an, a librarian associated with it that, you know, some of the, our librarians may be associated with several disciplines, but um, you, there is, you can check on the main library website, find my librarian, sometimes you'll see ask a librarian, but there are ways to find out. There's a list on our library website that, um, can show what discipline 
each librarian is associated with. And so I don't know, David, if you have a moment, if you could see if you could find that and put the link in, but no worries if you can't. Um, oh, looks like he did. So um, here's the link and we you can actually click on this or you can save the chat, but find the librarian. So for instance, agriculture and life sciences, you would, you would contact Jean Fander and there she is, there's her contact information, a little bit about her, a way to schedule an appointment and even to see what her scholarly activity is. So there's a whole bunch of um, people out there who can help you within your discipline. The other thing is citation chaining. I'm pretty sure what they're talking about is looking, see if you've got a great, great article that's very timely, um, it's fairly recent, take a look at the reference list of that article and you may find other references in that list that can lead you to more resources. So anything else you want to add, Nick? Actually, if we wanted to look at another one of those links and I've got another, yes. another, another thought here. So, you know, we coach writing. So let's keep one other thing in mind here. And that is that at the end of the day, you're producing a draft of something. Oh, and one, down here. one thing I like to consider and just kind of keep in my mind is that, you know, we're sort of in the, in, in the field of, of providing feedback on writing. And, one, and I try to emphasize to folks that there's different kinds of feedback that's helpful at different stages in the process. And I think similarly, th these kinds of resources can be instrumental at the right time and detrimental at the wrong time. So one thing we want to do is avail ourselves of the resources that we have, go talk with the librarians, do all those things. But if you've ever, I don't know, maybe your experience is different than, than mine, but I've pretty much never come out of a meeting with my advisor, my chair of my committee, without another book or five to read. And sometimes that's not what I need, because sometimes what I need is I need okay, I've got some words on the page. I want to add a few more citations. I need to add this or that or that in a kind of strategic way. I want to do the right thing. I want to do the ethical thing, the complete thing. Uh, but I also don't want to get uh, completely bogged down in literally uh, just um, the kind of light, you know, uh, scholarship that never stops. It is literally just constantly, there's new scholarship out there. So one thing to do is to make sure that you're taking advantage of these resources, but also um, making sure that you're referencing it against the, the stage that you are in your writing. Uh, and sometimes what you need to do is write an incomplete literature review and then come back to it and fill it out because you've got the, the overall architecture and then you can kind of fatten up the sections, fill them out. Uh, and other times, you know, you do need to discover new things. So just keep that in mind. Excellent. Excellent point, it's so true. So again, here's our final link. This is a different, same jam session. Um, it's the fourth screen and David, I'm assuming I should have checked. I'm assuming you put the link. All of those checklists Lou, will be um, available in the shared box folder. So um, definitely you'll have access to it. And let me drop this link in. Oh, thanks David. So if you want to just click on the link again, it will take you to the fourth, maybe the fourth Jamboard. This is the one I made several copies of. If you want to jump around to it, give it a minute. Um, what I've done is taken another kind of lit review paragraph and I've um, or series, yeah, paragraph as series of sentences. I've broken them up and put them out of order. Um, so I just, I gave you the same thing in like four different frames, I think. And you can always, if you're on one, you can just do this, click this down arrow and click duplicate. And there's another one. If you want to go in and play around with it, otherwise as a group, we can, we can figure out how would you put these sentences in logical order thinking about here's the starter topic and then here's how it's developed and also how it flows logically from one point to the next. And feel free to take these and move them around, do whatever you want.
and just take a couple minutes to play around with this. And I think to to figure out what the first one first sentence would be is you want to think about which statement, which sentence is making a point that the other sentences all relate back to in one way or another. Anyone want to take a guess on the first what what might work to start this one off? And the reason we're kind of putting this out there is because this is you're going to be thinking in terms of in a wide variety of ways, but in in like paragraphs and sections in terms of making a, a larger point, a broader point, and then narrowing it down. So let's try this. What if and this may not be right, but oh, all right, let's let's see. Okay, so let's try that. I was going to try this one. Let's try that one. So let's say the first sentence can, let's make that the first sentence of the paragraph. Building from that, what might logically come next? Anyone want to take a guess or change change your decision? Um, you know, however you want to do it. And don't worry, I, I know that this can't always be done quickly. If this is kind of a way of helping us think through, oh, what is the logical order? One thing, what just one suggestion I would put forth is, well, this is the one I always go to as the first sentence. When I look at it again, I think, wait a minute, they're talking about um, it, intergenerational trauma and dehumanization. Um, I'm wondering if this is a little broader and it maybe it's not. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, could we work from this, which kind of brings in that idea of all these practices mentioned here being rooted in a kind of dehumanization. Um, and maybe putting, trying that first. So I always, I always veer towards this one, but I think if I remember right, this is actually the first one. Um, then we want to think about, okay, so this sentence is referring back to an idea of displacement. Is there something that precedes it that might talk about a kind of displacement? Or are they talking maybe, is, is it related to social death? So where we say some of these men, maybe that's relating back to this sentence. And possibly, maybe, We want to figure out where this one might fit. Any thoughts? Maybe this would go before this one. And then maybe this could wrap it up. I'm not positive this is the right version, um, but this is one way, what you want to be thinking, and obviously you need to take time. Uh, yeah, 
Let me take a look here. Um, it is. It is very. <laughs> Kamala, yeah, yes, you will be. <laughs> but you won't be guessing. But this, it is. It takes some thought. So the point of this is not to make you feel like, oh, my God, I did. It's, it's instead to make us think about what does it take to make ideas kind of um, link together with, to create a relationship, a strong relationship between the main point and the ways in which you expand on and build on that point. So you won't be guessing with your own writing, but you, you want to allow yourself the freedom to move things around. We are actually at 631. So um, Nick, we, you know, we're just kind of showing you what resources are there. Is it okay if I just, okay. So these are the Jamboard links again, and um, different literature review resources, including some tutorials and a, <laughs> um, a wonderful video that is by a professor of Nick's called Get Lit, the Literature Review. So there's fun play on words, that sort of thing. Uh, different um, recordings and other um, tutorials on the literature review, the checklists again, and um, some and all these other these links will be active these things will be provided for you and also the documents all of these will be in the shared box folder and david will send a link out to you so thank you all so very much